position, whether it's your customer, your supplier, your employee, they trust you with their asset. They trust you with their personal information. It's the same as if you take your car in to, um, uh, to get it serviced. You know, you want to know who's going to work on it. You want to know that it's not going to be driven by someone over the border. You want to know that um, you're going to get it back. Um, you want to know that it's not going to be given to someone else. Um, and so if you start thinking about people's personal information as their asset, it can change your mindset a little bit about how you operate. Um, because it's really reputation and trust is going to be so important, particularly in a world where we're going to be fighting for space in a shrinking economy. Sorry, it was just a little cough. It's not COVID. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, okay, so just moving on to the um, the next slide. So let's just talk about where we are with with Poppy, um, and what it applies to. So the the majority of the sections came into force on the first of July this year. What that means, in essence, is that the whole of Poppy is in force, um, but there's a suspension on any enforcement for a 12 month period. So that means that everyone has an opportunity to make sure that they've got their house in order. However, this time period is gonna fly by. It really does. We all know, I mean, look, the last six months have just <laughs> disappeared in a blur. No one knows which day of the week it is. Um, I expect the, you know, the next year will go by very fast and there's lots to be done. After that compliance period comes to an end, um, there is actually scope for the minister to extend it slightly or in totally, um, but well, you know, it'll be either by sector or, or otherwise. Um, but after the 1st of July, 2021, there are gonna be serious consequences for non-compliance. So the penalty is going to be, is a maximum of 10 million at the moment. It can be increased. Um, but what people are really worried about is civil suits, and criminal penalties. There are penalties for individuals who um, are dealing with financial information, which a lot of you do. Um, you know, it, it, is, it is really, really important to get a grip on these things because the consequences are pretty significant. And as I mentioned, you know, because you, we're living in this global environment, you know, insureds or, you know, other people might find themselves facing fines, civil suits, class actions all over the globe and simultaneously. Um, and what, what recent research shows is that for every $1 spent on compliance with data privacy laws, you save $4 in a cyber breach or other, any other kind of breach because they are extremely expensive. Um, so what does Poppy apply to? Now, this is quite important. Um, it's always the first question with any legislation is to figure out exactly what is the scope. Now, there's obviously there's a presumption against um, laws applying outside of South Africa. So this is really about focusing on data processing in South Africa. And I'll get to what personal information is in a second. But there are two ways that it'll, it, it kicks in. One, the responsible party who I'll, I'll talk about what they are just now, is domiciled in South Africa, or the processing occurs in South Africa. So either by automated or non-automated means. So that means you use some sort of machine, a computer or whatever it is, to or, or a person filling in a form in South Africa. So there has to be some processing in South Africa, or you need to be domiciled here for it to apply. So who is the responsible party? So for those of you who might have seen other legislation like GDPR, they're generally called the data controller. Um, and this is the person under Poppy who controls the procedures and the purpose of processing personal information. They're the ones who determine what it is that they need. So for an example, an insurer may want, um, you know, may require certain information in order to enable the actuaries to assess um, the risk profile of a particular um, potential policyholder. And in those circumstances, um, you know, if the insurer requests particular information and they get that through the broker, in those circumstances, the broker will probably be acting as an operator on behalf of the insurer. So the insurer determines what 
needs to be collected, what will be processed, and the operator goes and process gets that on behalf of the insurer. So these, it's important to understand these two roles. One is when you are determining what happens, and the other is when someone is acting as your agent. Um, and it is possible to play both roles at various times. You know, for example, if you use a payroll administrator, you know, the payroll administrator will be the responsible party when they say, we need your contact details, we need, you know, some information to be able to, to do this. But they're acting as your processor when they use your employee's bank account details, um, you know, uh, salary entitlements, all of that in order to make those payments for you. So this follows the sort of standard concept in, in South African law that if someone's acting as your agent, you've got to have an agreement in place with them that makes sure that you delegate your responsibility to them. Because that's the important thing about Poppy is it's only the responsible party that is responsible for personal information. So if anything goes wrong, when someone's looking after or processing information on your behalf, you're gonna carry the can. So that's why it's very important and why Poppy says there must be a written agreement between an operator and a responsible party. So now what is personal information? You know, we use this term, um, you know, a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, it's just someone's like contact details and address and, and something like that. It is so much broader than that. The, the rule of thumb is that personal information must be able to identify someone. Now, South Africa is unique in the sense that, uh, well, unique along with Colombia being the only two countries in the world where data privacy laws protect juristic persons, so corporate entities. And that's because our constitution gives every person in South Africa a right to privacy. And a person can be a, um, uh, anything with juristic <laughs> ability. So a partnership, a trust, um, a company, a CC. And so we're not only saying, you know, are we talking about our customers here? Are we talking about, you know, we're talking about our service providers, our suppliers. You know, so when, when um, an insurer gets information about a broker, there's both the broker's information as well as the insured's information that might be coming through. So you just need to be thinking more broadly. And I just want to take a moment to say, Poppy doesn't prohibit the use or processing of personal information in any way. All it says is this is a valuable asset. So you need to make sure that you have considered all appropriate conditions to make sure that this can be kept safe and secure throughout its journey in your organization. So that's, that's the, the important thing. And when we're talking about, um, you know, what now, what do you do now? The first thing you should be thinking about as we're talking today is what personal information do you have in your organization? What do you deal with on a daily basis? You know, are you getting information about people's criminal histories? Are you, um, you know, do you have people's ID numbers? Obviously, in, your, in the insurance sector, the kind of information that you get is very sensitive. So you get two categories of information. You get ordinary personal information and you get special personal, personal information. This is race, health, disability, um, sexual orientation, trade union membership, um, biometrics, these are all things that are considered uh, more harmful if something goes wrong. So there's an additional level of protection that must be applied to those sorts of information. So you obviously are going to be processing, receiving, managing a whole lot of information um, that will fall into these buckets of what is personal information. And this is it, is what is processing. And it's, it's almost anything you can imagine that you will do with personal information. So it's any operation or activity, uh, whether you do it electronically using AI, doing, you know, whatever else you might do. Um, you know, if you have little things on your systems, collecting information, um, cookies, whatever else, um, that it, it's using personal information. So it's when you store it, when you collect it, when you receive it, when you send it to someone else, when you destroy it. Um, 
when you put it together in your own database. When you do any of these things with personal information, you need to be thinking, what am I doing to protect the privacy of this information? What measures have I put in place? And Priyanka is going to take you through the eight conditions and what things you need to be thinking about in terms of getting compliant in the way that you manage these. Um, because it's, it's really is, is through the whole life cycle of the information, you need to be thinking about what am I doing um, to keep this, this information pure. So this is the, the head of the information regulator. It's Pansy Takula. Um, she comes with mixed reviews. Um, and, uh, but she is very big in the African Union and driving data privacy as a priority throughout the continent. Um, the information regulator has pretty broad powers, as most of our regulators do. Um, the function is primarily to monitor and enforce compliance. Um, they can carry out dawn raids, uh, search and seizure activities, come and seize your servers, um, and all of those horrible things. Um, the thing that worries me most of all, actually, is the ability of the information regulator to sue for damages on behalf of data subjects. Um, this is not something we've seen in other regulation. You know, typically what happens, for example, like the Competition Act or the Consumer Protection Act, is that you need to have that flow of information. I mean, the, the complaint needs to be lodged with the regulator. It needs to be considered, decided, and then someone affected can go to court to get damages. That's not how it works in Poppy. You can have a parallel process um, where someone can approach court directly or circumstances where the regulator can go on behalf of data subjects. And that eliminates a lot of the challenges that parties face with class actions in terms of funding because um, you don't need, you know, if a regulator is taking that class action on your behalf, um, you don't run into those. So that makes it um, sort of a more attractive option. They also will manage, uh, the information regulator manages uh, situations where um, an information officer of the organization, and we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, refuses to give someone access to their personal information or, or something like that. They, they will be the arbiter of dealing with those, uh, those disputes and issues. So um, Pansy is very focused on um, things like uh, direct marketing. She's, she's very concerned about direct marketing and wants to have a reconciliation between um, the Consumer Protect Protection Act provisions and, the, uh, and Poppy um, because she believes they're a little bit inconsistent. I must be honest, I think they can live uh, together but um, there will be some reconciling. That is something that she's focused on. Obviously, cyber breaches, we, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable the, during lockdown, the extent um, of cyber breaches that we've had, um, that, that really it just has got uh, much more extreme. Um, and she's obviously very concerned about that. And then the focus is going to be on how do you manage personal information in financial and health sectors, because these are the most high value sort of personal information. And these are the issues that are going to be um, prioritized for this year. So she's indicated she'll be working with stakeholders in the sectors to, to do that. And I hope that she also involves the regulators in those markets, because as you know, the prudential authorities, the financial sector regulator are already very interested in personal information. So now Priyanka is going to take you through each of the uh, conditions for lawful processing and the compliance actions you should be thinking about as you. Great, thanks Roz. So these are the eight conditions for lawful processing under Poppy. Um, what's really great about these conditions is that they're mirrored in other jurisdictions data protection laws as well. So. Um, uh, you know, for example, the GDPR has similar uh, conditions for lawful processing. And what that means um, for responsible parties in South Africa is that, um, you know, if they are potentially compliant with the GDPR, if they have 
policies and, and documents and agreements all in place that, um, you know, that meet GDPR standards, it's very likely they'll also meet poppy standards. Um, there are obvious differences between GDPR and poppy, um, you know, so you'd need to bridge those gaps. So for example, Roz mentioned earlier, um, the nuance in poppy that deals with a juristic person's personal information. Um, but what, what's really great about these conditions is that they're ultimately commercially sensible um, uh, measures uh, required by Poppy, but that you know, if implemented adequately and properly um, in, in your company, um, it'll go a very long way to mitigate your, your risk exposure um, you know, to a data breach, which obviously comes with it um, potentially significant reputational and uh, commercial harm. So, um, you know, uh, I'm not expecting um, everyone to be reading um, a section of Poppy every night before they go to sleep to give them good dreams. But um, what, what's nice about Poppy is that it's, it's written in very plain language. It's very accessible, very understandable. Um, there's nothing, you know, very complicated about it. So you'd find these conditions described quite, quite nicely in the act and um, you know it's, it's a useful guide to have next to you when you are working through your compliance um, efforts in, the, in this grace period that we, we all have. So condition number one is accountability and this basically requires every every company to have in place uh, or to have appointed an information officer. Now, if you don't have an information officer specifically appointed um, to, to be responsible for the organization's uh, uh, puppy compliance, this will be the CEO by default. Um, and of course, you can appreciate why this would be a very, um, uh, you know, cumbersome and administratively burdensome process for a CEO to go through if, um, you know, depending on the size of the organization. Um, ultimately, the information officer must be able to answer questions from you know your clients from from the public from the information regulator on on um you know your company's processing activities the information officer must be able to say yes we have um various departments that process personal information we have our hr department we have you know our, our claims handling department and so on this is the kind of personal information they process these are the kinds of contracts they have in place um, to, to, to protect that personal information um, as well. So the information officer needs to have their eye on every aspect in the company, um, you know, be able to kind of um, internally monitor um, what's going on in the company, follow up with uh, key internal stakeholders find out, you know, um, what steps they've taken in that year to to make sure that that department is compliant uh, with Poppy. Um, you know, they, they need to kind of take charge of uh, staff training um, on Poppy compliance um, and, and so on. So, so that is really the key thing. Um, and again, all of these conditions, um, as Roz mentioned earlier your your compliance with these conditions will become enforceable from 1 July 2021 onwards. So you have the next year to figure out, um, uh, you know, how to comply with each condition. For accountability, you know, you'd need to look at who in the organization would have this role. We typically see that it's the uh, CIO, you know, your chief information officer or um, someone from your, you know, the compliance team. Um, and in some companies, we see a specific role uh, dedicated um, to, uh, to the information officer or data protection officer role. So the second condition is processing limitation. It is very important for you to understand why do I have this personal information? What do I need it for? Um, and, you know, when you're going through your compliance exercise and you're looking at all the personal information that you're processing, keep coming back to one of these or uh, you know, preferably more than one, um, these justifications, which one can you tie that processing activity to? And basically, if you have personal information you don't need or that don't fit any of these justifications, um, you have a problem, okay? You'll have to think about, you know, um, your, your, you know, whether you need to discard that information or whether you need to really interrogate what, what you need it for. So, 
you know, these are the, the usual justifications. Consent might be one that you're familiar with. Um, we caution our clients against relying solely on consent for processing. And, and the reason is, uh, is because consent is something that is given, it can also be something that can be taken away. So if you are only processing personal information because you know your client has consented to it, um, you know they can take that consent back and then you no longer have a lawful ground for processing that information. So we would encourage you to look at stronger grounds for processing. So you know, do you need that personal information in order to perform your obligations under a contract. So, um, you know, for example, you need the person's contact details in order to send them um, relevant information about the contract. You need their bank accounts information uh, if you're in HR and you need to pay them. You need to perform your obligations as an employer um, to your employee and, and pay them monthly. Um, so you need to say, well, I need this personal information. It's not dependent on your consent, but I need it in order to perform this contract or I need it because there's a legal obligation imposed on me um, you know by, by law that requires me to process this information so for example FICA or FACE you know where you are processing specific information um, not necessarily because you want to but because you're required to do so by another law and then obviously there's other things as well, legitimate interests of the data subject, of you as a responsible party or even a third party where you might need an information. An example of that is, you know, if you have uh, CCTV cameras around the premises, um, you know, some employees might say, oh, you're, you know, you're spying on me, you're, you know, you're tracking my every move. Um, but then, you know, as, as an employer, you have, um, you know, a duty to your employees to create a safe environment and to ensure their security and their safety. Um, so you must be able to keep tying that processing activity to one of these grounds. The third condition is purpose specification. And this, is, this can be tricky, um, you know, uh, depending on why you have that personal information and how you obtained it. Um, when you collect personal information, Poppy requires that this must be um, in the first instance where possible from the data subject directly. Um, and if not uh, from data subject directly, you need to interrogate how are you getting this person information? You know, is your company being provided this information because it, you know, it subscribes to a database and it's being, you know, supplied person information relating to, um, you know, to data subjects. And an example of that is, is the telemarketers, which, which really annoy me and I, I take immense joy in reminding them of Poppy whenever I get the call. But, um, you know, you, you speak to them on the phone and they say, no, 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 we got your number from this database that we, that, you know, our company has bought. Um, so, so you need to be able to understand where you got that personal information from in the first place. Um, retention is, uh, I think, exceptionally tricky because, you know, how often do we go back into our, into our archives, um, either on, you know, in your, in your documents saved on, on your computer or even, you know, your Metro file, your offsite storage and actively destroy information you no longer need. Um, you know, if you have a limitless, um, cloud storage or, um, you know, a very, you know, long contract in place with, with your, um, offsite storage provider, um, you may never go back and say, well, I don't need this information anymore. Let me go and destroy it. Um, but, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of movements um, in other jurisdictions in, in uh, the treatment of retention of information um, and, and saying that, you know, the moment you don't need this information for the purpose you collected it, you need to get rid of it. And you need to do it in a way where it can't be linked back to the data subject. It can't be reconstructed or restored. Um, you know, so for example, in, 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 my, in my documents, if I have information um, about clients I worked with you know, 10 years ago, do I need that information now? Or should I be going in and deleting it, not just from my documents, but also my recycle bin? Because you know, when you delete something on your computer, it goes to the recycle bin and it might not delete permanently. So you have to really interrogate um, what measures your company has in place. You know, um, what's about um, periods it needs to retain information for. Because Poppy doesn't say you must retain personal information for 
three years only because this will ultimately depend on why you have that information. It may depend on whether there are obligations imposed on you by, by certain legislations that say you have to keep personal information for six years um, or 10 years, um, or maybe you need it for you know, historical or statistical purposes, um, so you keep it for a longer period. The point is you have to know or have to understand, okay, I'm dealing with this personal information. How long do I need it? You know. Um, Shall we put a, a, a policy in place at the company that says, you know, employee information must be kept for um, two years after an employee leaves the company and then we have to send it off, off site and then we destroy it? You know, what, what measures do you have in place to, to really think about uh, retention periods? Um, and just to put it into context for you, um, some data protection authorities in the EU have um, come down quite harshly on companies who retain information longer than they need to. In one instance, a 14 million euro fine uh, was, was um, imposed um, on a company that retained information far longer than they needed to. So it is incredibly important um, for you to understand uh, how long you need the information for. And then that last thing over there is destruction and deletion. As I mentioned, it must not be possible for you to relink it back to the data subject. So you can say, yeah, yeah, it's deleted. But I go into your recycle bin and I see, I see um, the documents are still there. Um, you know, so it is, it is very important. Um, another example um, is, is aggregating data. You know, so under Puppy, if you're processing aggregated data, um, you no longer need to comply with the conditions under Puppy if that data doesn't contain personal information. So, you know, you're collecting, you know, all the, the you know, uh, just for statistical purposes, you're looking at how many employees in the company earn under above, you know, uh, um, earn above a particular, a particular salary amount. Uh, you know, you can keep processing that information provided that, you know, you're not really linking it to their name specifically. Um, and an example of, you know, destroying or deleting information or, or anonymizing it, uh, de-identifying it um, after you no longer need it wouldn't meet this purpose. Further processing limitation is um, you cannot process information for a purpose other than that which you collected the information for. So you can't say, well, I have this information, I might as well do whatever else I want with it, even though you know, I initially you know, collected the employee's fingerprints um, just for purposes of you know, uh, biometric access throughout the premises. As an employer, you can't say, well, I'm not gonna use those fingerprints to, to unlock employees' uh, work phones. You know, if we suspect that they're they're, they're committing some kind of fraud. We want to access their phones and we're going to use the same fingerprints we collected um, for the biometric access. You have to be uh, very careful about ensuring that all uses of personal information is consistent um, with the initial purpose you collected it for, whether it was you know, to investigate um, an insured's claim. Uh, for cover, whether it was to pay an employee or whatever your purpose was, can that purpose carry all the way through your processing activities? Do you need to rely on another purpose um, to process that personal information? And again, um, there will be exceptions that apply um, as they are for, for the other conditions. You just got to look at, you know, if we can't comply with this, do any of the exceptions um, um, apply instead? So, you know, an example over there is um, uh, uh, law, law enforcement, whatever the case is. So, you know, coming back to the example of CCTV footage, um, you know, if you're collecting it to monitor safety and monitor the security at the workplace, and then a crime unfolds at, um, at the premises and the, you know, SAPS wants to, to have a look at footage you might have, you know, to, in order to assist SAPS with the investigation of a crime, it may, it, it may be compatible with, with this particular condition, which says, you know, further processing, um, uh, you know, the limitation does not apply if any of those exceptions um, take effect. The fifth condition is information quality, which, which can also be a tricky condition to comply with. Um, you know, it's basically saying that any information you collect from your insureds, from the brokers, from, um, you know, your suppliers, from your employees, that information you collect, that information 
you process and that you make decisions, you know, using that information, um, you need to make sure that it's accurate, that it's complete, that it's not misleading, that you, you know, put measures in place to make sure that, you know, your such data subjects, when there are changes to the information, they let you know. Um, so this is quite easily managed, for example, through a contract where you say, this is the information we have about you. You have an obligation to tell us when your when your information changes, and that you know when someone requests change to that information, that that request is completed quite quickly, uh, within a reasonable period of time. There's no obligation on you to you know keep following up with people, um, you know to be launching investigations into a person's um, you know the accuracy of a person uh, of personal information you can collect it on the assumption um, a recorded assumption that it is accurate and you leave it with the data subject to say please make sure this is accurate when it changes let us know otherwise we will continue to you know process your your payments to this particular account number unless you advise us otherwise openness so the whole idea of poppy of the gdpr of any data protection law is the individual, it's the data subject, it's their privacy, it's them understanding what is happening with their information. And that example that Roz gave in the beginning about, um, you know, your data is your asset, it, you know, like a car, you need to know where it's going, who's handling it, is it going across to another country? All of these, you can't hide from the data subject, which is something that potentially could have been done uh, perhaps uh, more easily before instruments like the GDPR came about. And an example I'm thinking of is the Cambridge Analytica saga. Um, you know, for, the, for those of you who've watched the great hack documentary on Netflix um, or who followed, um, who followed the scandal at the time, you know, Facebook was providing um, Facebook users information to Cambridge Analytica. And um, Cambridge Analytica was using that information to create targeted advertising, uh, targeted content to users um, in order to influence their, their, their votes. And, um, you know, when all of this came out um, afterwards, uh, we saw a very huge change to Facebook's privacy policy, to Twitter's privacy policy. All of these, you know, social media platforms had to really go back to their privacy policy and see what they had there. And now, you know, if you look at Facebook's privacy policy, which is incredibly long, um, you'll see, you know, all these caveats that will say, you know, we do supply, you know, information to to um, third party advertisers, for instance, which is why you'll see, um, uh, you know, tailored adverts for, you know, the trip to the Bahamas because you keep searching for the Bahamas um, in, in your spare time. So it's, it's very important that the user, that the data subject understands what information you have of theirs, why do you need it, um, you know, uh, how long will you keep it for, Will you be sharing it with other third parties? Why will you need to do that? Um, is, is it going to be transferred to another country? Uh, for example, you know, um, you, you might have your hosting servers located in the Netherlands. So these are all things that the data subject needs to know. Now, it won't be, uh, it would be incredibly burdensome for you as a company to comply with these requirements every single time you conclude a transaction with with a client or you engage in a particular processing activity um, so so we find that it's it's best handled through a privacy policy that you direct your clients to you know so when you're concluding a contract with them you, you'll say you know we do process your personal information if you want more information about this please have a look at our privacy policy your privacy policy of course has to have all of this set out. It has to, you know, um, you know, it'll say, you know, we collect, for example, your your um, email address, and we use it to send you marketing um, content, or we collect your, um, you know, your criminal history because we use it to assess your premiums, um, or we use it to look at your, um, you know, the the the, the veracity of of a, of a claim you're making to us for cover. Um, so it's very important that the responsible party has a privacy policy in place that's easily accessible by data subjects so that they can clearly um, um, and very simply understand uh, what's going on with it with their personal information. Security safeguards is um, perhaps the the biggest they're all equally important these these conditions, but security safeguards is perhaps the riskiest one 
And the reason for this is because it speaks to data breaches. Um, you know, PopPD doesn't define what a data breach is, but it does say, as a responsible party, you have an obligation to, um, to implement both organizational measures and, and technical measures, and I'll get to that just now, um, against personal information being lost, being destroyed, being damaged, being accessed by someone who doesn't have um, the authority to access it, um, or, or by, you know, being destroyed by someone who doesn't have the authority to destroy it. And that language really just defines a data breach. You know, it's, it's someone getting into your organization's environment, whether from within or, 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 or from um, an external source, and accessing personal information. Something we find clients um, don't fully appreciate when they are compromised by a data breach is that it won't only be exfiltration of data. So you, you might have heard this data exfiltration term being thrown around, which really just means data is leaving the environment. That's an example of a data breach, but it's not the only type of data breach. It's any access to personal information that's not authorized. So for example, even an, a ransomware attack where there's been an encryption is an example of a data breach. Um, so you have to be very careful um, to ensure that you have measures in place to prevent a data breach from occurring. And the tricky thing is, is that the likelihood of you suffering a data breach are very, is, is, is very high. Um, but the measures you put in place to prevent it will go a long way to um, mitigate any penalties the re regulator might, uh, might impose um, or findings of, of non-compliance with Poppy because you can still be found to be fully compliant if you took all reasonable steps to prevent a data breach and one ended up happening anyway. So what those measures are, um, as a company, you have to be very careful to ensure. So it's not just technical measures, you know, and these data breaches we deal with for our clients, we see they have an excellent, um, you know, uh, encryption system, all these firewalls in place, two-factor authentication, passwords are being changed every 30 days, and so on. But they don't have organizational measures in place, which, um, which are equally important, you know. So this is, for example, um, staff policies on data protection. You know, the people who are responsible or who handle personal information in your organization what are they doing with that information do they know what their own obligations are under puppy do they do they handle that information with care um, with confidentiality ensuring that that information at all times is protected um, its integrity is 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 ensured um, it's, it's things like that and we find that a lot of these data breaches occur because of a lack of internal cyber hygiene um, where the staff just don't understand um, how to safeguard information they protect or you know they become easily susceptible to a phishing attack um, uh, you know which which can be sophisticated at times but sometimes it's very obvious the person who's asking for your password isn't from your IT department or isn't your CEO um, so again you have to be very very careful with um, with figuring out what measures to implement. Poppy doesn't say you need to implement X, Y, Z measures. That discretion is with you as the company to decide and it'll depend on the resources you have, but it'll depend on the, the, the risk you have, which, you know, as an insurance company, as brokers, you, you process very high risk information. So you need to have strong me measures in place to, to um, encrypt the information, to protect it, to ensure everyone understands what's going on. And what we find is helpful to understand this risk is by doing a data privacy impact assessment with, I'm not sure, um, you know, you probably are familiar with that term, but it's looking at what personal information do I have? Where does it go? You know, who, whom does it go to? Is it going to another country? Which country? Is it a country that has secure safeguards in place? Um, you know, do we have contracts to protect us if there's, if there's a breach? Um, you know, what is our IT department doing? You know, uh, do we have um, forensics on speed dial? Do we have our lawyers on speed dial if um, a breach occurs? Are we ready for when a breach happens? Um, it's, it's, it's a really interrogating measures like that. Um, Ross spoke about the significance of, of, um, of an operator under Poppy in the beginning, so I'm not gonna get into it again, um, but just to repeat that it's very important to have a written contract with your, with your operators because Poppy does not impose 
um, or, or does not allow data subjects or the regulator to proceed directly against operators for recovery. Um, so that so lies exclusively with, with the responsible party. So it's important for you to contractually manage your, your exposure in that way. And then this is just um, talking about notification obligations. I'm, I'm wary of the time and that we still want to have time for questions and answers. But it's just uh, saying that, you know, when a data breach does occur, you have to notify the regulator, you have to notify affected data subjects. And it's not when, you know, you've established factually um, through a thorough investigation that took three months to say, yes, our, our client's personal information was compromised. It's the moment you become reasonably aware, reasonably suspicious then, huh, someone's in our environment, they're, you know, they have malware that's installed on a server that processes all our clients' information, that's when your notification obligation is triggered. So um, it's very important to understand that, to understand that difference. Okay, and then data subject participation, this isn't something new, um, really, given that, you know, people have the right to know, the right to access their information, but what Poppy does is, is it, Contextualizes, contextualizes it specifically in the context of personal information. Um, you know, a data subject has the right to access that information to say, hey, what information do you have on me? They also have the right to say, I don't want you to have that information anymore. I'd like for you to delete it. You don't need my email address. I gave it to you so you could give me a receipt, not so you could bombard me with your, with your adverts. So, um, there will be instances, as I mentioned, with each condition there, 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 may, there may be exceptions. Um, but, you know, there will be instances where you can say, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to decline your request to, to correct your information or to delete your information because we need that um, to perform our contract or um, to pay you or, you know, things like that. Um, and enforcement, Ross mentioned this in the beginning, so I'm not going to get into it again. But, you know, in a nutshell, those are the, the eight conditions for lawful compliance with Puppy. Um, it's a, you know, very helpful to, to, to start getting, um, getting through, working your way through each condition. Um, but at the same time, obviously be, be mindful that there are other aspects of Puppy to factor in, in your, in your compliance um, exercise. Um, so, yes, yeah, just to close off, I'll, I'll just hand over back to Roz to talk you through um, just, just some things to think about. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I was trying to just ask questions while <laughs> catching up there. Um, we've, had, we've had quite a few. Um, I think just to, um, uh, just, I was just trying to respond quickly to this question about um, does it apply to, uh, to everyone? I think it's important to know that 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 Poppy applies if you are domiciled in South Africa, but if you are not, it applies to any processing of personal information done in South Africa. So there can be someone who's um, uh, you know a foreign entity or uh, offshore, but they're processing in South Africa, unless it's just sort of transmitting through the country. So um, you know there's there's no actual processing that happens here. Um, the other question I just want to address is this question of can you exclude liability by agreement? You cannot contract, you cannot contract out of statutory liability. Um, that is, you, you potentially uh, can obtain a, um, an indemnity from a, uh, in respect of third party harm. Um, but you cannot say to a data subject, for example, that they indemnify you against any loss of their information. Um, that that would not be uh, permissible, and that that would be sort of contracting out of your um, those obligations. Um, just moving up a little bit, um, how will Poppy affect call centers and telesales? This is going to be interesting to see because what Poppy does is it regulates electronic marketing. So that is limited. It doesn't um, it doesn't extend to sort of. Uh, necessarily to phone calls, although a lot of these things are automated now. Um, the regulator has, interest, has indicated that she is engaging with the Consumer Commission and the DTI or DTIC uh, to see if there can be some reconciling between the, um, the provisions. Um, essentially, it just means that telesales, they're going to have to be a lot more careful um, about the, the leads that they get, how they get them, um, and ensuring that they get um, uh, consent. 
Um, essentially, what Poppy says, you know, the current the position under the CPA is you can contact someone until they opt out, and you must give them the option to opt out. What uh, Poppy says is it's a far more opt-in culture. So you will um, you will have to um, you can contact someone. Uh, once if they're an existing customer to offer them, you know, similar services or goods, but not, um, you can't keep contacting someone or you can contact someone once for consent. So, so there's a lot to think about um, in terms of how, um, how this is going to impact on direct marketing. I would say people get very up in arms about this, but, but personally, my view is that, um, you know, you want to be contacting customers that want to be contacted, um, and and reputationally, um, you know, it's 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 great to um, not have customers going, oh, I don't want to be contacted by this person again, or where did they get my information? Um, so, you know, it's a good opportunity to clean up your databases. Um, just in terms of which reg ministry applies, it falls actually it falls under police, uh, so the Ministry of Justice. Um, so, um, yeah, and it's going to be <laughs> interesting to see how that plays out. Um, then, um, this, this question about uh, when someone leaves their employment, you know, the, the, as, as Priyanka sort of mentioned, you know, Poppy is fairly, um, easy to understand, um, in terms of what is required, but it is so fact specific. And, and the thing is that you have to really do that assessment every time you want to process information to ensure that you've met those eight conditions. So what you do need to be thinking about in your employment contracts and your IT use policies, um, in your, uh, your policies that might regulate uh, uh, people's own devices versus devices issued by a company, is making sure that you anticipate what you might need once someone leaves your employment and to ensure that that is covered in your internal privacy policy in your employment contract and others. The risk that you have in accessing someone's information once they've left is that um, a mailbox um, is tricky because it's not only going to include work, I mean, work-related stuff that you know, might be justifiable on the basis of legitimate interests of the, the responsible party, or, you know, maybe there's an investigation. It involves a whole lot of information, including special personal information. And so in, in managing that process, you're going to have to make sure that there are uh, limitations in place in terms of access to that information um, and, and various other processes in place. So, it's, it's, you know, it's, there's a no one size fits all answer because it, it really is, um, you know, what do your policies say? What does your contract say? Um, how have you, you know, communicated with employees? Is it a work issued device? Is it their own device? Um, you know, are they, uh, you know, we, we actually had a data breach um, issue a couple of weeks ago that was exactly, was a, an employee leaving on her last day, she downloaded vast amounts of information, um, which she was entitled to do in terms of her uh, authorization to access and use that information. But it was then uh, airdropped onto another device. And once it was gone, you know, there's no way of tracking it. So, so there are a whole lot of things that you need to think about in terms of those kind of uh, measures. Um, I hope, I think I've answered all of it very fast paced. So, um, but just some things to think about. Um, you know, I know um, obviously um, there's an I2 cyber risk policy. Um, it's something, um, you know, I mentioned in the beginning that the data shows that um, compliance efforts will significantly reduce the cost of a response to a cyber incident. And that's key for insurers to understand that they need to take a more um, proactive involvement in, in the insured's operations in terms of their compliance with Poppy um, or whether they have an incident response plan in place. Um, have they done proper assessments? Are they doing training? Um, because these are all the sorts of things that might mitigate the risk and might play into the premium ultimately charged. Um, as I said, I mean, we respond to a lot of these cyber incidences. I can tell you one of the biggest challenges we have 
is that the insureds don't understand their policies or that the brokers don't understand the policy. And then we spend the first day that should be triage and responding to the incident, arguing about what is covered, who is covered and what is permitted. So, you know, a cyber incident is fast moving. It's immediate. People need urgent, urgent advice and response. And so it's important to, to keep people educated on their policies, but also to understand your insureds um, and, and who the, the, the right people are. It's also important for them to understand that, you know, leadership must come from the board. Um, you know, it really is essential that um, in any organization with compliance that, that the message comes from the top. Um, also, for your own purposes and insureds and, you know, engaging with, your, uh, with each other as brokers and insurers, um, have you got, um, you know, have you got operators in place? Do you have contracts? Um, to deal with that? Um, are there indemnities where possible? Um, you know, have you, and one of the things that comes up quite a lot is when a third party has a breach, one of your operators, if you don't have the rights contractually to audit or to engage or get information during that, you can be really stuck. So, you know, the reality is, is, you know, a few months ago, there was a, um, a breach of one of Nedbank's service providers. The press said that it was Nedbank that had been breached. The thing is that party is responsible. So you need to ensure that where you are the responsible party, that you have adequate rights in place to manage a cyber incident. Um, because cyber incidences or any data breach, it's all about fast reaction and it's about protecting the reputation. Um, Worst case scenarios, you do not want the information regulator to have control of that narrative um, in terms of informing the public uh, about what has occurred. So um, very, very important that those, those are in place. Um, and then also just, just important to think about um, cross-border transfers or these properly covered um, and uh, you know, making sure that the, the proper measures are in place. What has happened in other jurisdictions is the regulators issue a list of jurisdictions that they consider to be safe. Um, we don't have that yet. So um, that really is a, a requirement uh, for any cross-border transfer of information. So I'm sure we've given you a huge amount of information and lots of things to think about, um, but I would recommend your sort of take home points is, you know, what are you thinking about your own compliance, the compliance of your insureds, how can they mitigate their risk? Um, and once you understand the, um, uh, your, your data flows of personal information throughout your organization, um, you will be able to start identifying, um, you know, where your gaps are, where you have to put in different measures. And just as a final point, my, my experience uh, goes for a long time now <laughs> on, um, on regulation and, and compliance is that South African entities as a, as a rule are not overly compliant. I think uh, COVID is, <laughs> is an example of, of this. Um, so wherever you can in putting in compliance measures, try and make them actual barriers. So rather than saying to staff, don't take that device home and use, you know, load personal information on it. Make sure that your system rejects any unencrypted device. You know, say, rather than saying, make sure you don't access someone's personal information, put in IT barriers to prevent someone accessing that information. Because, you know, these, you need to be looking at reasonably foreseeable risks. We know that it is reasonably foreseeable that even when people are regularly trained, that things um, will not always be followed. Um, and unfortunately, that's no uh, defense. If there's a breach um, and an access to information that's not authorized, then you as the responsible party carry the can, regardless of whether you tried to get your employees not to do it or otherwise, but it would certainly mitigate any penalty and the engagement um, with the regulator. So thank you for your time this morning and thank you for all the lovely positive comments coming through. Um, 
please do get in touch with us if you um, would like any advice to help you to become compliant. Um, but yes, lots to think about. And I hope that we've given you some uh, insight that will help you on your journey to compliance. Thank you so much, Rosalind, and thank you so much, Priyanka. I think that was that was very informative and, like you said, a lot to think about. And thank you for answering. I think most of the questions were covered, so thank you for answering the questions during the session. Just um, as people are leaving, I'd just like to remind everyone, if you haven't registered on the invite for the session, please make sure you do. Otherwise, we're unable to issue your CPD certificates especially because there's people that join with um, like just only their first name. So we're unable to track you down. So please make sure you do that. And then um, Rosalind, just quickly a question for me, you know, being in the insurance industry, we work with a lot of different parties, being brokers, insurers, and sometimes the wrong email does go to the wrong person. So if, if I receive an email from a third party, you know, pertaining some sensitive information, what onus is also on me to then say, listen, you've sent this email to the wrong person, or is that more of a courtesy type of a... Um, well, I mean, there the, the liability relies with the person who has, has sent the information incorrectly. Um, but also, I mean, you, you don't really want to be in possession of someone's personal information um, because it, it carries risk. So certainly, I mean, as, a, as best practice, um, you should inform them that that it's been sent incorrectly and that uh, and delete that. Um, you know, it's it is it is it's something that I think is going to be one of the hardest changes for everyone is to think more carefully about who they add to email chains, how quickly people forward information. You know, we're so so quick to um, to just answer the phone and say, oh yeah, sure, you know, I'll give you so and so's phone number um, or <laughs> any of those sorts of things. So. So all of us need to be more conscious um, of checking who you send correspondence to um, and how you do it. And particularly when there's such sensitive information, um, you know, that, that might be considered under an insurance policy. Um, and also just, just uh, one last note on that is think about the format of your, your communications. Um, you know, for example, when, when Zoom first <laughs> started, um, in lockdown, I mean, they've been around for longer, but in the beginning, um, you know, they, unless you adjust the security settings, everything's being recorded. And we, you know, we don't think about these things. Sometimes we're like, okay, well, it's just a convenience of a platform. Um, but you, there's an obligation to, to ensure that, um, that all communication is secure. Probably more of an answer than you were expecting, but um, yes, that, no, that could be thing. the way to do it. Um, I don't think there's any other questions, but if somebody does have a, a quick question, you're welcome to unmute yourself and, um, you know, just ask more than welcome. Otherwise, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. It was very, very informative and there were some people that unfortunately couldn't get on and aren't very happy at all. So we know that it is a, a requirement in the industry for these things to be, become more accessible. So um, we might might have to do more of them in the future. And I think, you know, the more and more of an um, alert it becomes, the, the more we need to understand this and make sure we're doing what we need to. So thank you so much, Rosalind, and thank you so much, Priyanka. And like I said, if there's anyone that'd like to you know, say anything or ask anything, please feel free to unmute yourself and just pop a question. Or oh, that's coming for you, or just... Um, uh, here's one question. Um, is there any additional coverage for cyber insurance that can be taken with regards to copy? So I think what I'll do is maybe this question, I'll pop on to Ryan because um, so the cyber policy does normally cover the full, it's intended to cover the fines and penalties that um, copy will, will issue you with. I don't know if Priyanka or Rosalind if you put any comments on that. Um, so it's not, I mean, it's, it's typically you, you know, the risks that you cover are kind of, um, you know, the risks arising from cyber breach. I mean, just to, uh, the one thing that's quite important to understand is that um, it's a, you know it's against public policy to insure against your own intentional conduct, um, and so um, you know insurers should look quite carefully about what pro what uh, policies cover. Um, you know, as as this starts getting enforced, if there are any criminal prosecutions, you know, um, are the you know will the legal costs be covered? Um, but not anything else. So, um, you know, it is, it is difficult to, um, 
insure against your own non-compliance with, with legislation, um, unless it's it's negligent, of course. Um, but you know, so that's that's just to to bear in mind. The biggest the biggest risk under Poppy is obviously a data breach, but there is there are penalties for non-compliance with many provisions. So um, that is the same as any other regulatory risk, and uh, the board must must take appropriate measures in any company to ensure that they have uh, managed that risk um, to ensure that there's no liability for directors either. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, I think just to quickly jump in from my side, so 100% the policy does cater for covering those fines and penalties, but it is to the extent insurable by law. Um, so where we're legally not able to be covering those, uh, what the policy will still give you, though, is the coverage for representations by by legal to the regulator, et cetera, to, to try and manage uh, those fines and penalties as much as possible. Thanks, Ryan. Thank goodness you're on the call. You could climb in. Thanks. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. So, thanks, Rosalind. Um, again, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. We know you guys are, are busy. And Priyanka, thank you to you too. We really appreciate that you guys are always willing to step in on these talks and inform us and update us. So we really appreciate that. And then thanks for everyone for joining. Really appreciate it. We wish you a lovely rest of the day and a great week. And look forward to seeing you guys again next week. Great. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Priyanka. Thank you, Rosalind. Thanks, Tammy. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Papa. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Tammy. Hi, Papa. Bye bye. Nice seeing you. Bye bye. Nice seeing you. <laughs> bye. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. Nice seeing you too. It was a nice uh, presentation. Good. Glad you enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Bye. Bye. Tammy. Just a quick one. One of my brokers have asked, are we going to be sharing the presentation and give me email it to them, please? Um, Fee, we will just check with um, the ladies and see if we are able to do that and then we'll confirm. I've also had a few requests on my side. Thanks, Sam. Okay, Tam, I think you can um, end, end your call on your side. Okay, great. Cool. Thanks. Thank you, Tammy.